Hey everybody, and welcome to this week's Design Cinema. This is Fane Zhu speaking, and in this episode, we'll be talking about uh, characters, uh, specifically rendering them with the line drawing still intact, and that's why we have these line drawings you see here. Now, the technique for drawing these guys out, you guys can see in the uh, another episode called, I think, Zombie Knights. Uh, it's the exact same technique where we, um, you know, draw this thing out with a rough drawing overlay. Uh, you know, again, check that other one out if you want to see how these are drawn. So these are kind of a, the designs of these guys are sort of a very video game based. They're very exaggerated. These are not real human proportions, but extremely pushed. Like this guy here is the big buff dude. They see in all the video games, and then we got the sexy girl who is usually a rogue or some kind of archer in games. And then you have the the stereotypical hero guy. So it's just kind of you know these designs are not out of this world or anything. But I think that's easier to showcase um, to you guys the difference in terms of silhouette and as well as uh, design finishing when we get to the rendering stage. So what I'm doing right now is just isolating the drawing out. Uh, this is basically the same thing as painting a mask because we use the mask to do all sorts of uh, different things too. When we start painting, texturing, uh, putting highlights, the mask will allow us to paint within this uh, drawing and not go into the background. Uh, because especially for characters, a lot of the uh, marketing department would like to pull these out for usage, in, for example, in a magazine or on a website. So by keeping them on a layer, it's uh, very helpful for that. So that's why this mask is, is there. Uh, now, as far as line drawing goes, line drawing, I think painting with line drawing is still intact is a little bit more rare than a few years ago when this stuff was really in, before digital painting took off. Uh, so everyone used to do line drawing. I mean, I did line drawings for years before moving to digital. Uh, but nowadays you're seeing more and more characters that are painted completely from scratch. There's no line drawing at all, which maybe we'll get into next week. Uh, I think the main uh, the reason for that is one, digital, I mean, completely painted characters look very cool, and two, it's actually faster, at least for me. In the time to do these three characters here, to paint them up in line drawing, I could probably do double the amount if we started this completely with paint. All right, the, the reason for that is because line drawing, you cannot hide things. Every single line must go somewhere, right? You can sort of indicate some stuff here and there with line drawing, but you really can't hide much of the information. Whereas a painting, you could do indication, and that's what painting is, is, is a series of lights, right? How does your eye perceive certain things? So you might not need to paint the back of this guy's boots or even the, uh, the sleeves and all these. You could just indicate just around amount of light that comes out from those areas, and a human eye will pick those areas up as a, as a sword or a shoe or whatever you want, right? So painting actually stroke-wise in terms of how much line work or brush mark you put on the page, sometimes a painting has a lot less uh, mark per, per say, pixel than a line drawing does, uh, has. So and that's why line drawings essentially takes a lot longer for me to do. So even this drawing here, each drawing took about at least an uh, hour, about an hour to draw. Uh, so that's that's a long time. In an hour, we could do a production painting. You know what I'm saying? So it's so that's why if, even from a client perspective, they prefer the, uh, the the drawing, I mean the painting stuff. So here they're all isolated. I'm just gonna clean stuff up, and then very soon I'm gonna bring in a texture pass, which you'll see me do in a, in a few seconds here. Right. So I'll talk about the the, the technical stuff uh, as we go, and then as the, the three of these are going to be repeats, right? We're going to start with a big guy and then we're going to repeat. Okay, so here's the texture pass. So this has nothing to do with the paint. All this stuff is is textures. And if you looked at the demo, the fat bug tutorial, I forgot which episode it was, but it's the big bug that's smoking a cigarette. That has the same technique inside in which we bring in a bunch of photo scrap to allow us to, for two things. One, to give us teeth on the canvas so we're not painting on a smooth uh, gray background which is you know very slippery in terms of just kind of the physical feeling of the of the uh, canvas so this gives us grip and two it gives us a local values you know that, that's similar to what I want to achieve see these photos have nothing to do with what's underneath right their their perspective doesn't match their details doesn't match it doesn't matter what I'm going for here is the teeth is kind of like the same thing as you as we do a production painting and we kind of scruff out the canvas it gives up uh, it gives the uh, brush a bunch of uh, areas to grab. So now I'm going to use those underlying textures and then paint what's uh, paint what's really there. So the armor, the forms that we developed, or right, ignoring what's underneath. Uh, some of the some of the textures definitely come through, and that's part of the look. That's you know kind of interesting um, effect that you get as a result of, of this technique. So. So now I'm just taking a um, chalk brush, the same brush I used to do my production paintings, and uh, start knocking those things back in, right? Getting rid of the texture underneath and painting uh, over the forms that I have designed in the line drawing. So again, the final presentation will have the line intact. This 
technique, I wouldn't go in this direction if this is painted from scratch because most likely we'll start with the silhouette and start developing the forms, build up the major shapes, and then start doing the texture after that. So, but because we have a line drawing that's already very tight in, in terms of presentation, uh, we could use this technique and it works uh, rather well because everything is defined for me already. Uh, so, and because this is production work, uh, uh, every step we try to do it to a semi-presentable level. So even the line drawing, all three were done before we move on to this stage. And this stage, I'm going to work for it for about, say, get about 40% there and move on to the female in the middle and then to the guy on the uh, right side. And we'll go back and con continually clean things up. Right? So that's just more production thinking to always make sure that we could show this at any stage during the uh, pipeline. So you or your, if your art directors or whoever you're working with could understand what you're trying to do. So here I'm moving over to the female character, this uh, rogue, thief, whatever um, character. So her design is a little bit general. You know, we actually talked about this in class as well. So you got these two guys who are very well armed, and then she's, you know, she's got armor, but then her belly is exposed and all this kind of stuff. This is more video game kind of stuff. It's, uh, it depends. It's demographic. Depends on what clients you're working with. You know, in reality, it doesn't make any sense. You know, she should be wearing the exact same armor as the guy next to her. Uh, but you know, video games in a way is appealing to male audience. Uh, I think it's about probably 90% or more. It's probably male just a guess um, and female and sexy stuff sells uh, sells products and you're going to see that in films you're going to see that in games um, you know some clients take a chance they, they make it uh, less risque you know to show less skin uh, but majority of the games and uh, films out there they're not going to go that route because they do need to capture the audience therefore capture the profits uh, otherwise you know no, no game company or film company is making it for for charity do you know what i'm saying so they're going to try to appeal to their um, target demographic so in this sense we're doing this kind of same thing but uh, we chose to cover up her her breast area at least so she's not showing giant boobs uh, and a lot of skin all that we cover most of her legs uh, so I chose instead to just to show the um, kind of the middle section the, the waist and a little bit of the hips uh, on this character so that's a little bit more about the design so she's doing going under the same treatment right now just getting the underneath um, textures and rendering this out to fit her design okay so I uh, make sure you guys watch this in HD. There's a lot of details in this. So uh, just watching full screen HD to help you guys see the little uh, subtle differences that's taking place within this painting. Um, so again, it, for the line drawing part, look at the skeletal zombie demo. And for the kind of texture overlay extraction, look at the fat bug stuff. Because I don't want to repeat the same demo over and over in each one. So And then the, the thing I'm showing in this one is more about the kind of blending of the textures into the line work. And also how to present something that has line drawing still intact. So and this is a good view. All three of them are in view right now. So if you look at the design, they're, they're very exaggerated. Like these guys, if you draw the skeletal system out, they'll have some humongous uh, rib cage and, and shoulder bones and whatever. But it's kind of cool. In video games, you can get away with that kind of stuff because it's kind of cool. And there's a couple of video games out recently that has this kind of design uh, influence. Um, you know, I think one comes to mind is like Brink, I think is a game. Have some very unique character designs that, that are very exaggerated, but they're yet still believable in, in, the, that, in the fact that they still could function. Uh, even though... Um, like the arms are huge and very very long and stuff and but that stuff is cool you know you don't have to stick to reality all the time as long as you understand where the influence is coming from okay so the technical aspect of this painting uh this canvas is very very large this is about a 10,000 pixel wide canvas we need that kind of resolution in order to capture all the details that are in the line drawing itself as well as the painting so that average averages to about 3,000 pixels wide per character. Uh, so this entire canvas is quite quite big, so you need a pretty powerful computer to even uh, work with this kind of uh, resolution. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of slowdown. So again, a DP, uh, the DPI doesn't matter. In digital, DPI is meaningless because we don't you know, uh, that's a very old term. Now it's all PPI, pixels per inch. So a pixel per inch in this painting then therefore is very, very high. So. Yeah, line drawing typically you need a very high resolution if you want to make it kind of semi-tight because I don't like to work with the single pixel brushes or brush that are like, say 5 to 10 pixels wide because they feel very awkward in Photoshop. They don't flow that nicely. So I like to work with say 20 or 30 pixel brushes at least, even for line drawing. So. So here I'm starting to balance out some of the values. You see me turn off the line drawings here again to check the values because essentially this painting, if we to, were to spend, or this drawing, if we were to spend another say two, three hours to complete it, we could actually essentially get rid of the line drawing and what's underneath could still read in terms of form development, are, are, they, are the values reading, right? So this is not a flat shaded painting. Right, these guys are not meant to be cell shaded. So even without line drawing, they should hold. So uh, even though we're presenting a line drawing, it's a good idea to check it without the line drawing to make sure that uh, what you're rendering actually is still holding up, uh, even without the help of the line drawing. 
Okay, so here I'm going back to the big guy now and getting some treatment, some secondary uh, pass now to get his details out. All right. So I didn't want to finish this stuff to be super super tight. Otherwise, this tutorial was taking me all day to do. So I think in total this took him about four and a half hours to complete from drawing. I mean the drawing part doesn't count, just the painting part. So it took quite a bit of time. Uh, but that's on and off, uh, you know, not working straight. But working straight, I think this could be completed about an hour each per character. So you're looking about three three hours or so uh, for rendering only, right? Then you have to add another hour to each character. So this is a full day's worth of work right here. You're looking at six to eight hours of um, energy that needs to be spent on this. And still not 100% completed. Uh, so I don't think any kind of design houses will require you to finish all three of these in a day anyway. That's a lot of work. Uh, but definitely you could do it in about a day and a half uh, for presentation. Okay, so here we're just gonna go through and uh, clean things up. And I'll try to take this chance to answer some of the questions I'm seeing on YouTube. So instead of me typing it, I think I just uh, save uh, verbally much faster. Um, so some of the questions I wrote down here, uh, one was, uh, do I use the Cintiq or Wacom? This I, I answered before, the Wacom Cintiq thing. And uh, just really quickly, it's all up to you guys. It's personal choice. They're all good products. I prefer the, uh, the Wacom 3 and the 4s, uh, 3 uh, specifically, but some, some of my friends that use the Cintiq so it doesn't really matter. The tool is not going to make you uh, good or worse or better or whatever. So it's about you know t test it out. If you go to a place that has a Cintiq, play with it. If you like it, then then use it. If you like the Wacom's, use it. Uh, it doesn't really make a difference at all. So for me, I, I like the Cintiq in a certain way, but I also don't like looking down. It hurts my neck in a way. Uh, I like to now kind of just uh, with the screen, you can look straight uh, you know in front of you, and it doesn't hurt your neck after you draw it for like nine hours a day or something like that. So that's you know that's about it. Um, Another thing, this is more pertaining to our school questions, which is do we use textbooks and uh, or anything like that to help our students? And the question is no, we really don't have textbooks. Our textbooks are things like National Geographic, Popular Mechanics, uh, you know, Popular Science. Uh, these are kind of the uh, the resource material because design is about understanding. And uh, the textbook stuff will teach you live in class. You know, the, these demos, like for example, the one you're watching now, that's our textbook. But to know what to draw, what kind of detail to put, what kind of functionality, that has to come down to the uh, the reference material, which is uh, which magazines like National Geographic is great at. Uh, let's just back up a bit, a little bit. Um, you'll notice I've turned the guy into black and white. That's the, essentially the same thing as painting in black and white. So it allows the eye to check for values. So another way to check values is just to blur your eye. If you blur your vision, you can see if the forms are turning or not, or is something very, very flat. Yeah. So a little bit harder with line drawing because the line drawing is always going to going to uh, distract you a little bit from the form is turning. So that's why I turn off the line drawing whenever I check the value. Um, okay, let's go back to another question here. Uh, one was the age thing, you know, is it too late to get into this business if you're already like say over 30 years old? And the answer to that is never, right? You can always do this kind of stuff. Uh, I've had students in the past uh, in the States who are much older than I was when I was teaching. You know what I'm saying? I had a guy who was I think over 50 years old uh, switching careers, but the guy uh, was doing something similar in the, in Hollywood. He was a more of a model builder, uh, built a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of films. But he decided to uh, change his skill set, and he became really, really good, you know, because he worked hard at it. And uh, I think he eventually went to Sony or somewhere to to do design. So it's never too late to do whatever. So uh, like the last video I said, you know, you only live once. So uh, if you don't like what you're doing, do something else. You know, saying so, then it's not just concept art, whatever you want to, do, you know. So. Uh, like for me, I always want to fly airplanes, and uh, one day just decide to drive down to the airport and go. You know what? Let's just let's just sign up to to learn how to fly an airplane. You know, just try it. It's uh, you know from the outside it looks intimidating, but once you jump into it, it's like anything else. It's it's a process, and if you can stick to the process, you most likely can learn learn the technique, right? So, all right. Next question is uh you know uh, color on different PCs, which uh, I think what they meant is that on different screens the color or the values look different and that is true so that's why I recommend you guys to get a screen that's very very nice uh, for me I always use Mac screens those screens are color balanced very very nicely uh, and these days you could plug in Mac screens to PCs right I'm actually rendering everything on I mean the machine itself are PCs like I use Alienwares for uh, most of my uh, equipment uh, but the but the screen themselves are, are um, Macintosh are uh, from the Apple right so the cinema displays because their colors are very well balanced uh, another thing you could do I mean there's really nothing can stop from you know, there's no way to 100% guarantee that what you have is correct because you might look right on your machine but you send it to your clients and they have a you know some monitor monitor that's not adjusted and they'll, they'll call you up and say it looks too dark there's nothing to do about that um, but that's why in most studios you go to like you go to EA or Ubisoft um, then 
generally like to print stuff on the wall so that way everyone can see it the way it's meant to be right because you're in charge of the print so you could kind of look at it to see if it's too dark too light too too saturated um so in the film studios as well most uh, almost all the studios i've been to uh, everything is printed out on the walls and present it in print format. Uh, that's why I'm so so big on cropping and these kind of things because presentation in print format is very different than digital because you cannot zoom in, you cannot pan around, you know. So you have to maximize the printing space. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how we get around the uh, the color thing is by printing. Uh, but yeah, get yourself a nice monitor. A nice monitor will help a lot in that aspect. Uh, okay, next question is: Do we draw more from imagination or from life to practice? And the answer to that is both. Uh, you have to draw. Uh, I think drawing from life in the beginning is very, very important uh, because you have to understand the, the things that are around you. You know how does light react? But at the same time, if you're a designer, uh, you also have to kind of start using your brain, getting those uh, neurons to start firing about ideas. You know, imagination, push those things to constantly think. So even if you're taking a shower or whatever, or just uh, going off to bed or something, think about ideas, think about these forms, and then you use the skills you picked up by drawing from life or taking a class and start drawing things that's coming from your brain, right? And that kind of leads to the next question, which is, again, this one's back to our school again, uh, is what kind of portfolio do we look for in a in, a, in an entrance studio, uh, a student? Um, and for that, it's all about the brain, right? The technique itself, that's what the school is here to teach you. We're, we're going to teach you how to draw well, how to render well. But the thing is, the idea, how good is your brain? Are you fit for a design career, or is it more of an illustration career that the, our student is after? Right, because for us it's all about the process. You know, how much of your brain, you know, are you thinking of? So, the portfolio could generally show that. So, if they're doing a lot of life drawing or some lot of still life, a lot of portraits, a lot of kind of illustration based things, we sometimes recommend them. Hey, maybe you know, are you sure you want to go into design because this skill is very useful in the world of illustration, like doing book covers and all sorts of different things. You know, magazine shots or uh, you know, Magic Gathering cards and all these, which are heavily illustration based, beautiful renderings, and that's a very good career path. Uh, design's a little bit different, you know. That's more about you know, if you play a game like Halo, would you rather draw the the battle scene of the aliens fighting, or do you want to design all the various suits and armor, right? There's kind of two little design path, I um, mean career path. Uh, of course, both they kind of crisscross, right? If illustrators are going to design, and you have designers uh, who also does illustration, so it's always crisscross. But we want to sh make sure the student is situated in the one they want to go into, because once you take a plunge into this. Um, career is so it's a year or more depending on what school you go to of your life that you can commit it to so but of course any kind of education is good so but you know still make sure that w the students are we're after is about you know um, design so we ask some questions like when you play a video game like Zelda or Final Fantasy you know what 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 do you like about these things and if they say oh I, I like the sword design like the characters like the world and I love to design those kind of things that's the kind of answers we want to hear so the portfolio is more to show like what are they thinking on paper Right, and we can help them then uh, achieve their goals in, in terms of becoming a designer. So so that's kind of just uh, some of the questions that we got on YouTube. Um, yeah, so let's get back to uh, this drawing. So these, games, these guys are all being repeated. So black and white value check. Right. This night guy didn't come out as round, I think, as the other two. I like the other guys. They, they get, especially the female in the middle. I think she's the most well-rendered one of the three. Uh, because these are again being recorded uh, as I do these, so it's kind of hard. Sometimes you want to fix something, but you're recording live, so you're like, eh, no time, you know, to fix it, uh, or to uh, delete some certain portions and restart. So uh, for him, I just kind of kept on going, even though I don't think he's, you know, if you blur your eye, he's a little, little bit flat uh, in terms of the values. Um, but it's good enough for this demo. So these are again the stereotypical kind of video game setup. I try to make it look like a, it's a character selection screen or something. So here I'm starting to put in some uh, design elements. You see me putting the backdrop. So it's almost like a character selection in an arcade or something. Uh, where on a console you're like, okay, do I pick the big dude, the sexy girl, or the kind of um, the fighter dude, right? And later you see me do some presentations as well to to showcase that. Um, here's some volumetric fog to start getting rid of some of the line drawing. The line drawing is still in there, but the fog will kind of minimize the effect as far as the line drawing that's in the distance. Because line drawing essentially, kind of, it could flatten your drawing out, right? Because the line weight is one way to pull it out. But you know, if you have a lot of line drawings on the page, the, for example, this female's hand, her, her line for her backhand and the front one, there's a little bit of thickness difference. However, that will flatten your drawing because the two lines are existing in the same value range. They're both black, right? So to lessen some of the values in the back will push that arm into the distance and not compete with her stomach or the, her belt area, right? The hip area. Right? Same thing with this big dude here. His uh, arm in the back, I try to push it back with fog. Right now that layer is hidden, the fog layer is hidden. We'll bring that back later for presentation. 
So this whole thing, uh, I think I'll cover all the technical aspect. This is drawn on my laptop, which isn't the most powerful thing anymore. It was about two years ago, but uh, it's, it can still handle this drawing okay. But if I also bring this into a full pa full painting, I probably need to bring it home to my um, to my more powerful machine at home. So I'll probably upgrade my PC here at work pretty soon because every two years I, up I need to upgrade my PCs because they just get too slow, you know. Because uh, you know it's a it's a catch twenty two. You get faster PC, so you work in higher resolution, but then higher resolution requires a uh, faster machine. So it's all you're always kind of on that pushing the technology versus quality thing all, all the time. Okay. So here I'm doing some uh, bounce light. The way to think about these, the light lighting wise, is a uh, kind of like a photo studio where you set up some diffuse lights on both sides to give you some nice bounce. Uh, you have a main source, but the light is not a spotlight per se, but more of a, you know, they have that kind of soft filter in front of it to come either from above, you know, kind of like a soft draped light coming from above to light these guys up. So you get some very gentle lighting as well as the two bounce from either side, right? It's a typical photo studio setup. So we'll light these guys exactly the same way. So now I'm just adding highlights. So it's always this progression, big forms and then secondary and then tiny little details like highlights that gets put in. So to ensure um, the pipeline kind of production um, way of working. Yeah. This guy's almost done. I mean, the, all, all three of these are almost ready for presentation. Right now it's just last minute touches. And I'll actually do a couple passes for presentation, which you guys will see. Yeah. So this process, uh, I think it's very cool. I think in video games, it works really, really well because it matches, uh, especially s certain games, looks nice with this kind of presentation. Maybe the game has a cell shaded look already. All right? So this, um, you know, there's a lot of games out there like Borderlands and stuff. They actually have this uh, technology where you can render the outlines of the characters, which is a pretty cool look. Yeah. So maybe on those projects, you guys could find this kind of uh, technique useful. Yeah. So I per personally, I still prefer line drawings. I love lines. It's just that they, they take a long time to do. And, and also most clients don't prefer them anymore. They all want uh, paintings. So, but I think I love, you know, for me, if I were to look at someone's portfolio, I actually prefer looking at their line drawing or their sketches more than anything else. I think there's a lot of life to line drawings. You see the designers themselves come through uh, because a very tight painting, for example, it's, uh, you know, especially on the professional level, stuff to start to look the same after a while. You know, whereas a line drawing, especially the sketches, uh, everyone has their own way of sketching, own way of approaching certain forms, you know, certain shapes, and how do they uh, suggest a certain uh, thing or how to turn a corner and those are the kind of things I find very interesting when looking through a professional uh, or anyone's sketchbook you can see how prof how experienced they are by looking at the way they handle the line line work yeah like someone who's been in the business for a long time could draw very very quickly but every single line is controlled and it could indicate just by a tiny little bit of line weight hit on a corner you could tell that they're indicating a form term and that's uh, that comes from experience so you could pick that up so I think most studios as well when going for an interview they like to look at your line drawing all right, so here's final stages of presentation. We're about to wrap this up. So this is just color balance, and I'm, um, you know, this is some outline just to, you know, nothing here is painted. It's all just Photoshop, little Photoshop tricks, you know, glow the little uh, corner by just blurring. I'm gonna erase out some of the line drawing, you know, and leave some of it in. The line drawing here is about 80%, so they're not so strong. So, and that's about it. You know, I think I'll try it on the white background for a while as well, but uh, I leave it in this form for presentation. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and next week, maybe we'll jump into the characters again, except we'll do it completely painted, no line drawing at all. So anyways, I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I will see you guys uh, next week. Oh, and one more thing to add, if you guys want to see the higher res version of this image, you could get it at my blog, which is uh, fengzudesign.com blogspot.com and uh, usually whenever there's design cinema that has an image image you could go there and download it so that's about it so uh i'll see you guys next week bye bye